All right, Jen, what is the end of a wild, wet, woolly week here in Walterboro? And I've used all my W words here as we start the third consecutive edition of the Week in Review on location from the front porch of the Low Country here outside the Colleton County Courthouse. We're going to have to buy property here, aren't we? Uh, apparently. It's like pitching a tent, except we actually don't have a tent. If you look around, every other news outlet with tents, we're sitting here. We have a tent, we just haven't put it up. What the hell? Really? Yeah, it's not raining that hard. All right, man well, up. we'll man up. Um, our third edition of the Week in Review here from Walterboro, the end of the third week of the main event of the Murdoch Murders Crime and Corruption Saga Gen, the double homicide trial of accused killer, disbarred South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch. This news outlet, we've been the tip of the of the spear on this story from the very beginning been following this trial blow by blow we are now mostly through somebody just rode by and yelled guilty interesting we're getting some random polls from passing motors folks that's interesting <laughs> but now midway we can safely say midway through this trial i would yeah but we'll get to the schedule in the minute in a moment here but jen let's bring everybody up to speed on what was an absolutely wild week here in Walterboro. Let's start at the very beginning of this week, the first big development, the ruling by Judge Newman regarding admissibility. And it went whose way? It went for the state. He said that he found the financial, the evidence of his alleged financial crimes was more probative than prejudicial and allowed all of it in. And Jen, just to recap for our audience, how many financial crimes is Alec Murdoch facing? How much money he is, is he alleged to have stolen? And how much jail time could, could he face if convicted? <laughs> <laughs> Do the Murdoch math memory. real quick for us. I believe we are at 99 charges on multiple indictments. Not all of those charges are financial, though. He's facing hundreds of years if convicted of all of them. Over 700, I think, yeah, was the last. Yeah, I think, yeah, last count. I, what else am I missing? The money. How much? The money. money. Oh, ten, almost ten million. Almost ten million. Yeah, absolutely. And these financial crimes, we have been uh, prosecutor Creighton Waters has been putting on a clinic yes. ever since Judge Newman allowed that evidence to come in. Creighton Waters has walked through multiple witnesses. We've got a list here of a few of those. Jeannie Seconder, the former, uh, I guess she's still the current chief financial officer at at the Parker Law Group, which was formerly. Uh, had the Murdoch name in it, the big Murdoch law firm down in Hampton. We heard from her. We heard from Alec Murdoch's former paralegal, yep. uh, Annette Griswold. Uh, we heard from uh, Jan Malinowski from Palmetto State Bank, yep. uh, Mark Tinsley. Mm -hmm. We also heard from Alec Murdoch's best friend, Chris Wilson. Uh, and it was fees that were stolen from Chris Wilson in the amount of nearly $200,000 that first raised the red flag on Alec Murdoch's shady financial dealings. Right, Jen? Yep. We also heard from Ronnie Crosby. That's right. One of his, his former law partners. Tell us about the, the testimony these witnesses provided. Again, a lot of folks were critical of the state's case, saying that they were kind of mixing, uh, confusing the jury, interjecting all this financial evidence into this double homicide trial. But what did you think? How did, how did you think it played? I mean, I think it presented well to the jury, but I, I don't think that the second, because they testified first, in camera without the jury present and then came back after Judge Newman allowed the financial evidence in and did a second testimony. I'm not entirely sure that all of their testimonies were as effective the second time around as the first time around, but I do think that it did give the jury a good presentation of potential motive in terms of what Alec was thinking when he murdered his, or allegedly murdered his wife and son on June 7th. And all of that financial testimony, Judge Newman in allowing it to come in, found a nexus somehow to how it was impacting Murdoch on June 7, 2021. Right. Each one of those, whether it was the various ways that he stole money allegedly, whether it was the pressure he was uh, ostensibly under due to the boat crash case, which we've talked a lot about here, we'll get into that in a minute. but every one of those items had some nexus to June, June 7, 7th, 2021. They sure did. And do you think the state did a good job tying all that together or are we still waiting for the puzzle pieces on the financial crime? To be I mean, I, I feel like the puzzle on the financial crimes has been presented is fairly well put together. And now we're just waiting to see more about June 7th and the aftermath. Mm -hmm. And we started to see glimpses of that towards the end of the week and how it obviously ties right. into that double homicide trial. Now, 
The second big thing that happened this week after that financial crimes uh, evidence was admitted, the second big thing, the testimony of Michelle Shelley Smith. Mm -hmm. Now this was, uh, jurors absolutely riveted to her testimony. Yeah, extremely emotional, extreme that she was clearly very frightened to be there. Um, well, tell us who Shelly Smith is first. Let's get, let's yeah, give everybody sort of the context, 30, right? Some 30,000 foot <laughs> context. Yeah. Who is Shelly so, Smith? Shelly Smith is one of the home health aides that the Murdoch's hired to take care of Mrs. Murdoch, Alec's mother, who has Alzheimer's disease. So she was caring for Libby Murdoch the night of the homicides, June 7th, 2021 and testified about Alec's movements that evening. She did, and not only did she testify about Alec Murdoch's movements, but very importantly, she testified about Alec Murdoch coming to her after the fact mm -hmm. and telling her, oh yeah, I was here for this amount of time on the night of the murders, wasn't I? Sort of planning right, that. Right, planning that seed in her head while mentioning that she had a wedding coming up and perhaps that was expensive and he could help pay for it. Could help pay for it. And, oh, by the way, he knew some people in the school district where she worked could possibly help her with some career advancement. Right. All that kind of tied together, Jen. Oh, oh, almost in the same sentence, it seemed like. And at first, again, significant testimony, obviously from Shelley Smith, but at first didn't seem like you know, it was connected to anything, but as, right. the, as the week wore on, we saw some of those connections. We'll get to that in a minute. But before we got that connection with Shelly Smith and her testimony to some later developments in the trial, something crazy happened on Wednesday, didn't it, Jen Wood? Yep, I was uh, very surprised when the court was adjourned abruptly Wednesday afternoon. And when we got outside, we found out that there was a bomb threat called into the courthouse. Absolutely. Shortly after 12.20 p.m. on Wednesday of this week, a bomb threat was called into the Colleton County Courthouse right behind us. Mm -hmm. uh, Judge Clifton Newman very calmly. I mean, this guy's, I don't know if his heart rate's gotten over 70 this yeah. whole trial, but this calmly evacuated the courtroom. Uh, court was back in session that afternoon at 3 o'clock after the building had been swept. This news outlet was the first to report on that. We also were the first to report on the law enforcement response to that. So far, we have not had a statement indicating who was responsible for that threat. We do know that the call originated from Ridgeland, South Carolina, and that the call came in through the main switchboard. We have received some unconfirmed reports that it was a call that was placed by an inmate uh, at one of the correctional institutions there in Ridgeland. We don't know yet whether that's the State uh, Department of Corrections facility there or the Jasper County Detention Center. But again, we're still awaiting a statement from State Law Enforcement Division right. on that bomb threat. Crazy day though, wasn't it? That was a little bit much. I mean, not. I mean, I would say nothing can surprise me with this case, and it always does. So the day after the bomb threat, we had a bombshell drop regarding the Murdoch family, and particularly the fact that they had been moved back from their place of prominence, just two rows behind Alec Murdoch, to the very last row of that defense side of the courtroom. Now. Jen Wood, tell us a little bit about what happened there. So <laughs> our sources told us that they were uh, allegedly passing items to Murdoch through his counsel, his defense counsel. Um, and they- Big no-no. Yeah, big, can't do that. Um, and they had been asked to stop and were not happy that they were asked to stop. That's correct. And in fact, we were told that Buster Murdoch, the surviving son of Alec Murdoch, kicked a water bottle over when he was asked to move from his seat uh, in the courtroom. We're also told that uh, Murdoch's sister- Lynn Gody. Lynn Gody, the victim's advocate in the First Circuit. And by the way, a victim's advocate who's in court all the time, should they not know those rules? I mean, yeah, they absolutely should. And again, but uh, a number of, of, of complaints filed against the members of the Murdoch family, uh, inappropriate uh, communications with uh, Alec Murdoch, inappropriate uh, physical contact, you're not supposed to- No touching. No touching, uh, and then also obviously the passing of potential contraband. Right. And one thing that we learned, very interesting, because of the contraband that was passed up to Alec Murdoch, court officials ordered a drug test. That's right, a drug test of Alec Murdoch. And again, we don't have the results of that test. We've been asking our sources 
throughout the week. No update on that. But again, this happened on Thursday, just uh, two days ago as you're watching this and on then your Saturday. Buster also apparently was admonished by Judge Newman for potentially making a concealed obscene gesture at Mark Tinsley, the attorney for the Beach family, during his testimony. That's correct. The old one finger salute. Uh, Buster Murdoch was accused of using a nail biting technique. I won't replicate it here. Yeah. Just suffice it to say it was the, again, single digit extended uh, toward Tinsley. Now I did ask Mark Tinsley about that and Tinsley told me, he said, hey, I thought, I thought he was biting his nail. Tinsley probably giving him the benefit of the yeah. doubt on that. But again, Tinsley brings us back to that boat case, Jen Wood, mm -hmm. the story that really launched the Murdochs on the statewide stage. Right. Uh, as far as having a statewide audience be aware of who they were and the influence that they've wielded here in the 14th Judicial Circuit for uh, over a century. Right. Um, Jen, tell us a little bit about that case and why it's been so integral to these proceedings that we're, we're watching this week. So, I mean, a little quick background on that case is on February 24th, 2019, Paul Murdoch and five friends were driving home from an oyster roast in Beaufort County and um, allegedly Paul Murdoch was driving the boat shortly after 1 a.m. when it sped up and crashed onto Archer's Creek Bridge and injured two of his friends pretty severely and threw 19-year-old Mallory Beach into the waters where she was found eight days later, unfortunately. Absolutely. Paul Murdoch allegedly driving the boat at the time it crashed. He was ultimately charged by the Office of Attorney General Alan Wilson, the mm -hmm. same team prosecuting this case, with three counts of boating under the influence. And at the time of his death, Paul Murdoch awaiting trial on those charges. He was facing up to 30 years in prison. Correct. Jen Wood and prosecutors had indicated they were not inclined to cut a sweetheart plea deal, given again the prominence of this family and the right. perception of special treatment. So obviously, that boat crash case has continued to play a huge role in this case. And again, it also plays a proximate role to this hearing, Jen, based on what, why is it so connected to June 7th? So Mark Tinsley, attorney Mark Tinsley from Allendale, he was representing the Beach family in a wrongful death lawsuit that was filed shortly after the accident. And leading up to the homicides of Maggie and Paul Murdoch, he, was, he had filed a motion to compel Murdoch's financial information saying he believed that Murdoch was hiding money. That's right. Murdoch told him he was broke. Tinsley did Tinsley not believe, believe that. It. He said he had active cases going on. He knew there was money coming in yeah. and he he said whether Murdoch's attorneys told him that he may be able to cobble together one million dollars and he said that was absolutely not going to be enough to cover the loss losses sustained in this accident. Tinsley testified on the stand. He said he was broke. I didn't believe it. He said I wanted him to prove it. Yep. And that leads us directly into what I think perhaps the biggest development of this week, at least as far as the prosecution's case is concerned. I wrote a column earlier this week, early Thursday, discussing the prosecution's case and uh, how it had not. We got a mat. I want to ride that motorcycle, whatever that guy. I didn't even know what that was. Was that a motorcycle? Get me on that crotch rocket, people. Anyway, um, where were we? I got Tinsley. myself distracted. Tinsley. Correct. So we're talking about the column that I wrote on Thursday morning, assessing the status of the prosecution's case and arguing that they hadn't quite gotten where they needed mm -hmm. to, that this case, again, a circumstantial case, we knew it was right. going to be a circumstantial case with no guns, mm -hmm. clearly, but arguing that they hadn't quite gotten where they needed to on building that, that double homicide case. Financial crimes, obvious. Yeah, obvious. Guilty of sin. But on the double homicide, again, my column pointed out that, look, this is not his financial crimes trial. This mm -hmm. is his double homicide trial. They've got to give us a little more. Well, Jen, we got a little more on Friday, didn't we? In fact, we, we got sure a lot did. more. We got a very unexpected testimony from Blanca Simpson, who was the Murdoch's housekeeper for, I believe she said about five years. That's right. Um, so Blanca was brought to the stand and testified about the months leading up to the homicides and in addition to being their housekeeper, it sounded like she was a close confidant of Maggie Murdoch. That's right. And in that context of that relationship, tell us a little bit about some of the things that, according to her testimony, Maggie Murdoch shared with her. So leading in a couple of months prior to the homicides, Maggie had pulled Blanca into 
the hunting room at Moselle for a cup of coffee to discuss the, um, uh, Maggie told Blanca that she was extremely anxious about their finances because the boat crash lawsuit she had heard could cost them almost $30 million. Um, she also told Blanca that she didn't believe Alec was telling her everything, which I thought was interesting. And, and Maggie, according to Blanca Simpson's testimony, said, we don't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. In response to the concern about that $30 million potential judgment. And the other thing that I found very compelling was when she talked about the possibility of them losing that money. One of the things that Maggie Murdoch allegedly said to, to Blanca Simpson was that she didn't care. She would pay it. That, she, that they would give all that money just to make it go away. Right, and they could start over. And that they could start over. And obviously, as we noted, earlier and on the live broadcast that, you know, they never got that chance. Right. Apparently that decision was made for them, according to the state, by Alec Murdoch. Let me ask you this, while we talk about that, I want to come back into the Maggie Murdoch uh, conversation with, with Blanca, and I want to come back into what else uh, Blanca testified about Maggie Murdoch. But before we do that, I want to talk quickly. We're talking about if the state's right, if Alec Murdoch made that decision for them. Mm -hmm. Does this go into that criminal profile that we've heard so much about, the familial annihilator, or the family annihilator? Jen, tell us a little bit about this criminal program. I know you've done some research on it. Well, I mean, family annihilators, it's, it's a big criminal psych psychological research, research field. Um, they typically are white males, middle-aged, and I think you told me that 30% of them are under financial stress. Or a that's third of them. What some of the studies have pointed yeah. out, yeah, that, that's one of the big motivations. Right, and a lot of them are narcissists, which we're ch checking a lot of boxes here. Right, Jim, right. Like, check, check, check. Uh, are you surprised though? And obviously, based on everything we've been told by prosecutors, Alec Murdoch fits that profile to a T. Are we surprised that prosecutors aren't introducing some uh, forensic criminal forensic pathologists or some? Uh, uh, state's not done They're with not, their case yet. Psychologists. Psychologists. I mean, the state's not done with their case yet. I mean, we still have time for them to introduce a criminal profiler. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, do they even have to? Right. We'll get to timelines in a minute and the time frame for where we expect this case to go over the next few weeks in terms of when this trial will draw to a close, when this case will be in the hands of the jury. Before we get that, let's go back to Maggie Murdoch and that testimony from Blanca Simpson. Mm -hmm. Another thing that she testified to regarding, and again, this is so compelling with Maggie Murdoch because we heard it former Attorney General Charlie Kind and he was speaking with Channel 4. Uh, the local uh, ABC affiliate down in Charleston, and he talked about how earlier in the trial, when the state was presenting the cell phone evidence, that it was almost as though Maggie Murdoch were testifying from the grave. Right. Did you get that feeling as we listened to Blanca Simpson? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was really the first time I had seen a glimpse of who Maggie was as a person and a human. So it was, I mean, it was one of the more poignant moments of the trial so far for me. I mean, we hear about Paul a lot, right. but we haven't heard a lot about Maggie. And clearly that testimony just gripping the jury. And another thing I wanted to point out, we mentioned this earlier in the show, and I want to jump back to it, because this is very significant about Blanca Simpson's testimony. We mentioned earlier in the program about Shelly Smith mm -hmm. and about how Alec Murdoch had allegedly seeded, in conversations with her after the fact, seeded a timeline that turned out not to be accurate, not only based on Shelly Smith's testimony, but the evidence from Murdoch's vehicle. Right, and his cellular data as well. She said that it was a 15 to 20 minute uh, break that Alec Murdoch took when he went to visit mm -hmm. his mother in Almeida. Murdoch said, no, I was there 30 to 40 minutes, 30. wasn't I? Right. Right, but uh, she ended up being right, he ended mm -hmm. up being wrong, and that came into play in a big way when Blanca Simpson during her testimony discussed Murdoch seeding another alleged lie in her mind about right. the clothing. Right. Tell us a little bit about this, Jen. So Blanca says that on June 8th, the day after the murders, she went to Murdoch's mother and father's home in Almeida, and he directed her to go to the Moselle home to prepare it for visitors. So she went over to Moselle, and she was talking about what she found when she arrived, her observations. Um, first, the first thing she says she noticed is when she walked in the kitchen, 
the um, pots and pans from the dinner she cooked the night before weren't on the stove where they typically would be the next day. Um, and she found them in the refrigerator, all the pots and pans with the lids on, which as any woman knows is a total man move. <laughs> she also talked about Maggie's pajamas being laid in the doorway of the laundry room. So they were like folded, it sounded like. And she said that um, that, that was extremely un unusual. She said there's, you know, Maggie would never leave her clothes in the middle of the laundry room mm -hmm. doorway. Um, also, she said that Maggie didn't wear underwear and she slept and there was a pair of underwear laid on top. So she said she went upstairs to the master bathroom where she found um, a puddle of water outside the shower with a towel. And when she went into the master closet, she saw another damp towel with a pair of khakis sitting next to it. Hmm. So she did what any housekeeper would do. Washed the khakis. She washed absolutely. the khakis and the towels. So the other question is, is the, she was talking about when Murdoch left the morning of June 7, 2021. She said he had a pair of khakis on and a blue vineyard, vineyard vine. I don't, I'm not Southern, man. Come on. Everybody <laughs> knows Vinnie Vines. Vines. Vineyard Vines. Vinnie Vines. <laughs> uh, shirt on. Um, and she had fixed the shirt on the collar because the collar was folded up. One, one side was up. She fixed the collar. So she clearly very vividly remembered what he was wearing. And she said she never saw those items of clothing again. Wow. Right. And she also talked about a blue collared Columbia shirt that he was wearing in the video earlier in the evening on June 7, 2021 with Paul where they were filming the tree. Mm -hmm. So she, Murdoch was trying to plant in her head what she saw him wearing. And that took the jury right back to Shelley Smith's testimony right. because again that you now have two completely different witnesses mm -hmm. testifying that Alec Murdoch was essentially using them. Right to create his alibi. Now let's talk about the timing of that yes, conversation. Very that, significant. Walk us through why, when and why is it important? Right, here? so Blanca said that Murdoch approached her in August of 2021 and started planting the seeds about what he was wearing, what she saw him wearing that day. That is the same day that SLED completed their third interview with Alec Murdoch, which we have not seen yet. I'm told right. that this is going to be a very interesting interview for people to watch because this is when they really started putting the pressure on him. It's also the day that Duffy Stone recused himself from the case. A significant day. Right. In Something the big happened in that third interview to make him start sweating and trying to change Shelley's or change Shelley's memory or um, Blanca's memory of what happened. Absolutely, and obviously if you're familiar with the progression of this investigation, agents of the South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division interviewed Murdoch three times, mm -hmm. once. June, the, well, the morning the of morning, June 8th, right. but you know, right after the bodies were found. Once on June 10th, 2021, in a squad car outside of John Marvin, his brother's home, his hunting property, and then again in August. And it was the August interview after that was conducted that all of this blew up right. and he began to seed that alibi creation right. narrative to Blanca Simpson. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen that third video. We have Obviously, not. we've seen the first two. They're holding on to that for a reason. We are told that there is a deer in the headlights moment yeah. for Alec Murdoch when he is confronted on that third law enforcement interview about the fact his alibi has been busted. Right. And so that's obviously will be a key, uh, uh, just another. I was also told that perhaps we see Alex's true colors come out in that video. So, ah. yeah, I mean, I mean, whether or not we see a little temper or anger come out of him, it's kind of the impression I got from my sources, but I'm, I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting that video. So a high stakes reveal. Mm -hmm coming up in this trial at some point. And again, let's talk a little bit about timing now. We did hear from Judge Clifton Newman as, as the proceedings were gaveling to a close on Friday that this trial's trajectory appears to be on track for the state of South Carolina to conclude its case sometime Wednesday mm -hmm. uh, of this coming week, which would be uh, three and a half weeks into the trial. Correct. 
Now, Judge Newman also said that on Thursday of this coming week at 4.30, they're going to have a hard stop on proceedings, uh, and that obviously the following Monday, President's Day, court will not be in session. Mm -hmm. Now, this is interesting because we know that the defense has indicated to the prosecution that their case will take roughly a week. Right. Uh, five full days of court is what we've been told. But if they are starting on Thursday with an abbreviated day and then they take Monday off, does that make it a little harder for jurors to follow that defense narrative? Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, this is going to break up their case a little bit. It is. And again, the defense planning on calling several technical experts. We do not yet know, however, if they will call the defendant himself, Alec Murdoch. But today, in or rather in Friday's uh, hearing and proceedings, we did see a hint at that when Alec Murdoch's name was invoked by one of the attorneys on the prosecutorial side, uh, John Metters. Mm -hmm. They were talking about that conversation that Alec had with Blanca, and they implied that you know if they proceeded with that line of questioning that they would have to hear from Alec to hear his side of the conversation. Absolutely. They accused defense attorney Dick Harpootlian of attempting to change Blanca T Simpson's testimony, yep. putting words into her, uh, or rather into Alec's mouth that, uh, according to Simpson, he didn't say. And if that happened, well, the only way to get the truth was to call Alec Murdoch to the stand. Yep. There was also some fireworks in that exchange. Dick Harpootlian, <laughs> Murdoch's attorney, literally they call it, called it the eruption of Harpootlian. That man jumped out of his chair so fast, I don't know how his pants kept up with him. Just indignant <laughs> over, over the testimony being offered. But here's the thing, and again, I want to throw back to the very beginning of this trial. Dick Harpootlian's opening argument wasn't bad. Mm -mm. Didn't seem as though the jury was necessarily enamored with him, but it didn't seem like they were upset with him either. But very early on in his examination of these witnesses, it seemed clear the jury had a bad taste in their mouth with Attorney Harpootlian, and, and after that, Jim Griffin, Alec Murdoch's other uh, counselor, has been carrying the load, mm -hmm. doing the heavy lifting. I on mean, Dick Harpootlian's going to be a hard sell in the low country. I mean, he's not <laughs> overly relatable. I mean, even when he was talking to Blanca Simpson, you know, he forgot that he had met her before, and she pointed out, no, I met you at Maggie and Paul's wake. It was kind of an awkward moment, you could tell. I mean, that's something that the jury heard. I mean... Absolutely. And let's not forget, this is an, uh, a jury of eight females, mm -hmm. uh, four males. And you got to be, let's, let's think about this too. It's the women who are driving the prosecution, whether it's uh, Jeannie Seconder, right. whether it's Shelly Smith, Annette what, Griswold, Annette Griswold uh, Blanca Simpson. And this case is being driven by some very strong women. And you know, the other thing that's, that's interesting is we talk about all the well-heeled lawyers mm -hmm. that have come to testify, these wealthy uh, white men called to the stand to testify, but it is again these these women who are in positions not quite so uh, high and mighty, lofty. I think they call it high cotton down in these parts. They're not in these rare the rarefied air. These are people who have real jobs. You know, hell, Shelly Smith working two yeah. jobs. Yeah. These are people that the jury relates to. Right. They relate to these people because they're like them. Yep. Yep. And they, I mean, they have come across as believable they've come across that great memories i mean some of the stuff blanca remembered i was like whoo i mean that is impressive i i i mean women are ruling this trial they really are let's hear it for the girls people now uh, no we didn't talk about no uh nathan tootin's testimony yeah walk us through that that was end of the day uh on friday, friday. a little I, yeah. name drop there jim walk us drop. through walk us through that so nathan tootin is one of paul murdoch's closest and oldest childhood friends they lived together for the half a year their freshman year in college in the cabin on the property at moselle they were clearly very close nathan tootin's now a law enforcement officer with the city of walterboro he also was a runner for Alec Murdoch's firm, PMPED, working directly with Alec. And he was talking wow. about many <laughs> checks that Alec had him run over to Palmetto State Bank and cash. And when he cashed them, they asked him what he did. And he said, I took the cash in an envelope back to Alec in his office. And they asked if there was ever anybody in the office when he returned with the envelopes full of cash. And he said, three names. He did, those names, Greg Alexander, mm -hmm. 
the police chief in Yemassee, South Carolina, Corey Fleming, mm -hmm. an attorney who has been indicted in connection with Alec Murdoch's alleged financial crimes, and the last name, Chris Wilson. Right. And uh, some, some interesting testimony there because on cross-examination, uh, Tootin was asked, are you implying that Murdoch gave these people the cash from the envelope? He said, I'm not implying anything. Yeah, I'm just telling you what I observed. Just telling you what I observed, but obviously those cash envelopes, a, a, another. What I noticed is interesting is neither Greg Alexander nor Corey Fleming are on the witness list. And that surprised me from day one. You have any thoughts on that? I, you know, I was shocked both of those names were not on the list. And it, it, it almost begs the question now that they've been entered into the record right. related to these cash envelopes, whether or not we will see them added to the list, perhaps, or whether or not we will see some sort of, because um, again, after the defense presents this case, remember, the state has an opportunity for rebuttal witnesses. Right. If there's testimony introduced by the defense that the state believes uh, they've opened a door, mm -hmm. And Judge Newman, Clifton Newman, from the very beginning of this trial has been clear, if somebody opens a door, he's going to let the other yeah, side. walk right through it. Absolutely, he's been very clear on that. From and he's the been very good about that as well. Like, and consistent. Yep. And consistent, so we could see those names. Um, let me ask you this though, Jen Wood, the big picture, pulling back the lens, mm -hmm. based on everything we've seen this week, building on the first two weeks, has the prosecution moved this case across the red line? I kind of felt like they were in the weeds this week with all of the financial crimes, kind of losing, you know, I mean, I know they, they were trying to show motive, but they were kind of losing the true, you know, why we're truly here, which is to talk about the homicides of, you know, wife and mother and a son. Um, but I feel like towards the end of the week, they started to pull it back in and I'm starting to see where they're going with things. Well, and the one thing that we know, uh, this jury has been very engaged, mm -hmm. particularly over the last two weeks. They were m mostly engaged in the first week, but after that video, yeah. after the video that shredded Alec Murdoch's alibi, the one placing him at the kennels, literally less than five minutes. Yeah, and that, they, the that's killing. a key point in the state's case because they keep asking every witness who is close to Maggie, Paul, and Alec to identify the voices in the video and every single one of them has said with certainty that it's Alec Murdoch's voice in that video, placing him at the kennels at 844, just five minutes before they believe Maggie and Paul were murdered. Absolutely, and jurors obviously have heard Murdoch uh, on multiple occasions, particularly in those law enforcement interviews. Mm -hmm. They know it's him. Right. I mean, you, it's, it's him. Right. He's there. So he's not napping. At He's the main at, house. Yes. He is at the kennels where he said he was not. And next week, we may get to see the video where Murdoch is confronted <laughs> about that inconsistency. <laughs> and again, we're told this is one of the, the key pieces yeah. of remaining evidence. Uh -huh. Now, I've asked multiple sources close to this case on both sides. Does the state have a bombshell up its sleeve? Does it have a, a trump card it's going to throw down on the table sometime between now and the end of the day on Wednesday? Not hearing that that's the case, but just that it's a steady accumulation right. of testimony like uh, Blanca Simpson's, of the introduction of this video, mm -hmm. and that the hope is that that will push things across the line. Again, I call it a red line into this zone of right. erasing reasonable doubt. Right. Uh, Jen Wood, if you're a juror right now, has the state, and again, we've still got three more days at least of, of the state's case, have they convinced you beyond a reasonable doubt that Alec Murdoch pulled the trigger of both the shotgun that killed Paul Murdoch and the missing 300 blackout that killed Maggie Murdoch? For me, no. For me, uh, for Tell me, me a, a reasonable doubt. Like, I have to have absolutely no other plausible explanation for what happened to Maggie and Paul Murdoch. They're not quite there yet for me. Okay. I mean, I don't know that I, I could be in the minority, but for me personally, they're not quite there yet. But I am trying to take this, the information that they're presenting and listen to it like a potential juror would. Like it's the first time I'm hearing it. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know <laughs> all things Murdoch. What about you? Well, let's not forget, Guy, oh, you throw it back gonna, Yeah, me. you're going to dodge my question. I'm going to agree with you because, again, I wrote the column again uh, on Thursday morning indicating that the pressure was on the state mm -hmm. because they hadn't done it. So I'm in right. your camp as well. Okay. I'm going to say they have not gotten me there yet. But here's the thing. 
We know that we have not heard yet from what is going to be the key narrative witness in this case, uh, David Owen, the, the lead investigator mm -hmm. on the double homicide. We are told that his testimony and perhaps the testimony of at least one, maybe mm -hmm. two other SLED agents is going to start assembling this jigsaw puzzle. Again, we've talked about this story from the beginning as a 5,000 piece puzzle uh, that people are trying to put together in a hurricane. Well, the winds have calmed. We've got all the pieces on the table. We're starting to get the borders. Right. And now it's going to be filling in uh, and we're going to hear these narrative witnesses again, uh, uh, David Owen from SLED and perhaps one or two other SLED agents. Uh, they've got a tough job ahead of them, don't they, Jen? They have a tough job. They do. I. David Owen, I, he was present for the first two interviews of Alec Murdoch. I'm assuming he was present for the third as a mm. lead sled agent. We'll find out soon. Right, right. So, I mean, I do, I have high hopes that he's going to be able to pull this together for the jury and for the state. Mm. Well, folks, there you have it. Week three of the trial of the century in South Carolina, the double homicide trial of accused killer, disbarred attorney Alec Murdoch, the scion of one of the most powerful and influential families in the state, dominated the low country politically, legally. Uh, they've been called a dynasty. Um, held the 14th Circuit Solicitor's Office for an uninterrupted stretch of, what was it, 86, 86 years? 86 years, yeah. Unbelievable, just, uh, and you see, we've seen, I think we saw in Shelley Smith's testimony, there's still some fear of that Murdoch name, of that influence that this family has wielded for so long in courthouses like the one behind us, in Hampton, mm -hmm. Allendale, all across the 14th uh, Judicial Circuit. So, again, truly the end of a dynasty, one way or the other, no matter what right. happens here. Right. But just an unbelievable story. And in fact, there's multiple uh, reporters here who are writing books on it. Yeah. Uh, Valerie Borline from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Mandy Matney writing a book on yeah. it as well, we're told. So, we'll Michael DeWitt as well. Michael from, DeWitt. Yeah. From, uh, that Wicked Hampton, they just launched pre orders of that. At, I love the history side of yeah, stuff. Yeah, DeWitt's so, got yeah. that covered. Though. Yeah, and he's, I mean, his knowledge of Hampton County history is just unrivaled. And also, let's not forget, we get in trouble with some of our friends from Netflix, if we didn't mention this. Yeah. Um, February 22. You've seen all the documentaries preceding this one, but on February 22, Netflix drops its big documentary on the Murdochs. Did we get to see your handsome mug in that one? You know, I'm, I'm alleged to be in it, but it's sort of like Southern Charm. Was I really in it or not, you know? Mm. Were you? Yeah. <laughs> first episode, first scene, first season. I was apparently too attractive for that show. <laughs> I was just too good looking compared to the other male yeah. leads. You know, they had to, they were, other male leads were complaining. Pretty obviously. Just way too handsome. But, um, so keep your dials tuned. I don't know if people Netflix and chill, is that the word? Or does that mean something else? I think that means something else, buddy. Uh-oh. I better not say that then. I'll, I'll save that for the TikTok. Yeah, for the TikTok. That's where I have my fun is on the TikTok. <laughs> um, it is called the TikTok, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You keep just doing that. Just making sure. Um, but as we await that, again, uh, February 22, the big Netflix documentary will be dropping. Um, Fitz News does have a bit part in that. But again, it's a story that goes all the way yeah. back to that boat crash that we've talked about so often that we discussed in detail. That They started with that. I'm told that some of the um, uh, boat crash survivors are really going to drive that documentary Good. and tell that story. Because again, they've not really spoken yet. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll talk about what happened that night, which again, by all accounts, is what led us here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's what caused the entire house of cards to fall. Absolutely. The downfall of a dynasty based on that one tragic night back in February 24 of, of 2019. Jen Wood, you've been driving our coverage of this case from the beginning. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. Dylan Nolan has been running our live uh, feed, live stream rather, all week. Uh, just amazing work by both of you. Just completely under tremendous pressure, competing against news outlets 10 times our size. Cannot say how proud I am of the work that this team is doing. Again, as I say often, we were the tip of the spear in this story, the first outlet to report almost all of the, the major developments in this case. We've been driving it from the beginning. We've been here from the beginning in Walterboro. Yep, on site, in person. And whether that means buying property down here, it's looking like. <laughs> Ocean property in Walterboro. Is the marriage, let me, before we go, let me ask you, the, my uh -huh. marriage capital, my marriage capital is at an all time low. <laughs> 
I was, I, I mean, I'm going to have to make some serious deposits in Listen, that bank. I've got an 11-year-old son who misses me. The other two don't even see him, but notice I'm gone. I know. Uh, <laughs> well, and a lot of folks here, you know, again, we, we talk about this story so often, but a lot of folks make it a lot of sacrifices. Yeah. Um, whether it's the folks trying the case, the prosecutors, um, you know, witnesses having to change right. their lives around. Right. Um, you know, and clearly we saw in some of the testimony the emotions and yeah. just what some of these witnesses are going through, torn between the truth and the loyalty of the family, torn mm -hmm. between, you know, uh, obligation and, and fear, perhaps. Right. You could see it on their faces and just, it's, it's really impactful. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Any predictions for next week, Jen, other than the video? I still am not sure if I think Curtis Eddie Smith's going to make it to the stand. I'm hopeful because that is the question we get the most. Um, but I, it sounds like his attorney is still on the fence whether or not he'll be called. I think that's safe to say. We actually interviewed Amy Zimmercheck earlier this week, and she told us she felt it was 50-50. Yeah. Uh, that Curtis Eddie Smith would be called to the stand. But you're right. I mean, every morning, that is the question we get above all others. It's also the first thing I do every morning is I check that Lexington County <laughs> Detention Center roster to make sure Eddie's still in there. To see if he's still there, <laughs> because obviously if he's getting transported, then we know something's yep. up. But um, the Curtis Eddie Smith story, again, the boat crash has been a huge part of this trial. Right. The financial crimes have been a huge part of this trial, but so far very little... Very little. I mean, there's a lot of pushback from the defense when that roadside shooting comes up. So, for example, Chris Wilson was asked because he met with Alec on the front porch of his parents' home on September 4th, just before the roadside shooting. And they started asking him about the shooting and they pushed back and said it's hearsay and the judge sustained that objection. Of course, this is the Labor Day 2001, or rather 2021 mm -hmm. incident in which Alec Murdoch, according to him, uh, was attempting to have uh, Curtis Eddie yep. Smith shoot him in the head so that right. his son, surviving son Buster could collect on a $10 million insurance policy. Both Murdoch and Curtis Eddie Smith charged mm -hmm. in connection with that shooting. Right. Uh, also, Curtis Eddie Smith facing drug charges, facing some fraud charges. Um, he's got a litany of uh, Yeah, he's, he would be <laughs> a risky issues, witness to call. So I'm on the fence whether or not he's going to appear next week. Um, but I, th I mean, I, th I th think the state's starting to pull their case together. I think we should start seeing them tie it up with a bow and hand it over to the defense to present their case. Absolutely. We've said it often. Usually in these cases, we have a sense of where it's going. We have a sense of what the outcome will be. We have a sense of where the jury is. We have a sense of all these things. There's this no case, crystal ball for this case. Can't do it. Throw it out the window, people. Yeah. Anything can happen, and as we saw this past week, anything did happen. Anything yep. and everything happened. Yep. But thanks, Jim Wood, for your work. Thanks, Dylan Nolan, for your work. Thank you for watching this edition, special edition of the Weekend Review live on location here uh, from Walterboro, South Carolina. Well, we filmed it live anyway. Yeah. Like Bill O'Reilly, we did it live. <laughs> Dylan loves that clip. Yeah, I know. He showed it to me a couple times this week. He it likes makes me it happy. He likes it because I, I prima donna like that. Yeah, I know. I know. In fact, I did it two or three times during this episode, he just cut it out. Uh-huh. Very kind of him. Where would I be without We're making a blooper Nolan? reel. All right, put it on the blooper reel. All right, guys, we will catch you next week. Thank you for the, joining this special edition of the Week in Review on location from the Colleton County Courthouse. We will catch you.